getting diagnosed with fibromyalgia just before my 34th birthday. Hello everyone, welcome back to my podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's video, which was heavily requested by you guys, I will finally talk about my fibro diagno diagnosis and my relationship with having a chronic health issue, right? It's new to me, I'm new to the language, and I'm new to the vibes. So if anyone has any advice, great, but keep the medical advice to yourself as I do have doctors. The doctors have been very helpful in this journey and also it has been quite a confusing journey also because of doctors. So what I wanna do is I wanna have a conversation about American medicine, my relationship with the whole process, good and bad, and how everything is a catch-22, right? Getting diagnosed took a second, it was really difficult and it cost lots of money, but also having an answer is a beautiful thing. So this podcast might feel a little up and down. I feel a little bit, <laughs> I already feel a little bit like making it. I can feel like the tension in my chest. It is hard getting diagnosed with something new that is contested on the internet as both something very real and something in people's heads. And it feels weird. So I wanna refer to gov websites and reference to fibro just so we're on the same page of how I'm viewing the illness, okay? So before I jump into my story, let's jump into the science. So this is from the National Institute of Arthritis, Muscular, Skeletal, and Skin Diseases, and it says fibromyalgia, okay? I'm just gonna read from their website, excuse my dyslexia. Fibromyalgia is a chronic, long-lasting disorder that causes pain and tenderness throughout the body, as well as fatigue and trouble sleeping. Scientists do not fully understand what causes it, but people with this disorder have a heightened sensitivity to pain. There is no cure for fibromyalgia, but doctors and other healthcare providers can help manage and treat the symptoms. Treatment typically involves a combination of exercise or other movement therapies, psychological and behavioral therapy, and medications. It says, who gets fibromyalgia? Anyone can get fibromyalgia, but more women get it than men. It can affect people of any age, even children, but it usually starts in the middle age, and the chance of having it increases as you get older. It occurs in people of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. If you have other diseases, especially rheuma, rheuma, rheumatic diseases, mood disorders, or conditions that cause pain, you may be more likely to have fibromyalgia. These diseases include rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, words I cannot pronounce, depression and anxiety, chronic back pain, and IBS. So what are the symptoms of fibromyalgia? The main symptoms of fibro are chronic widespread pain throughout the body or at multiple sites. Pain is often felt in the arms, legs, head, chest, abdomen, back, and buttocks. People often describe it as aching, burning, or throbbing, so literally head to toe. Fatigue or overwhelming feeling of being tired, trouble sleeping. I've always had trouble sleeping, but definitely the fatigue is a lot worse. Other symptoms may include muscle and joint stiffness, tenderness to touch, numbness or tingling in the arms and legs, problems with concentrating, thinking clearly, and memory. This has gotten very bad for me personally. Heightened sensitivity to light, noises, odors, and temperature, digestive issues such as bloating or constipation. I'm definitely having a new relationship with my body. These are everyday symptoms that I do feel like I have to tackle and have a relationship with every day that I never in the past thought much about, especially digestive issues, especially the muscle and joint stiffness, the tenderness to touch, the numbness, like all of this is very new. The, I think for me, the problems with concentrating and thinking clearly and memory have been some of the worst things to tackle, especially because my job is being a YouTuber and being online. I think that's been the hardest part is that I'm just not working as much. I'm not as productive. There's like, a, there are a lot more challenges. My spoons are depleted faster. So this is just an everyday new reality for me personally. Now I have borderline personality disorder. I was diagnosed in 2018 and that was a really relieving diagnosis. I was really struggling with my mental health, trying to balance multiple jobs, relationships, and my life was falling apart. You know what I mean? So when I got that diagnosis, it put my life back on track. Sort of something similar happened here where I had finally tackled the borderline. I was in DBT. I'm in remission. Everything has been going great for a few years. I've been just like on top of it, happy and joyful and loving my life. And last year, uh, around the April time of last year, I had gotten COVID the year before in October. So October to April, April, I was feeling like a consistent decline in my health and uh, I was living in a small town in Arizona. I wasn't very social, but I was seeing my family members and I hadn't got the shot yet. So I hadn't gotten the COVID vaccine yet. And I 
was basically inside all the time, except when I saw my family. So when I got COVID, I didn't think much of it, to be honest with you. I think I was probably a little arrogant about how I was not worried about it, but it did end up, I think, causing or encouraging the fibro to show itself because after I got it, I declined heavily. My lungs wouldn't come back to normal. My body was aching. I was a mess. I was losing my hair. I had skin patches of raised skin all over me. I had gone home at some point to see my family in California. And when I was exposed to the sunlight, I started to notice like this really awful rash that started to occur. I have photos. I actually kept a photo log on my phone for a doctor because I knew eventually I would have to go see one because I was just feeling not like myself. Um, Within a year or a year and a half, I would say, since the symptoms started, I compiled a whole slew of photos and videos and documentation about my symptoms, presented them to a doctor, and initially they were pretty confident it was lupus. I'm mad at myself, I think for being sick. And then I was mad. I didn't know why I was sick. And then I was so pissed because I stay relatively like healthy. I try really hard. You know what I mean? To only have a couple of bad vices. And then when my doctor told me, like he looked at me, he goes, girl, this is like lupus. I was like, ah! I felt relieved too, because I was like, fuck, we have a name for it. And you know, the irony of this all, I wouldn't have even known what lupus was except from Dr. House, of course, but I didn't know what lupus was. But my friend was like, hey, I think you have lupus. And I was like, no. And then I asked my doctor, disappointed. Yeah, Squeaky D, I think I'm disappointed that I do have something that is going to change how I live my life because my life is like peak. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I can't have this right now. This is fucking up my plans. But you know what I was really afraid of? I was so afraid that I was like going to die in five years and then I was going to adopt a kid and die on them. So as long as I maintain my health, I don't know though, guys. <sighs> Anyways, so, um, yeah, interrupted. Yeah, I feel, do you feel kind of interrupted by it? Yeah, I feel, <sighs> I feel annoyed, you know, they were pretty confident it was lupus, which is so interesting now especially since that meme goes around about it's never lupus, you know, from Dr. House. But they were so confident it was lupus. And they had done that basically uh, – they had had that confidence because of the documentation I had been taking. But then, of course, we got tests done and none of them showed that I had lupus, which is very interesting because it felt like I had every symptom, right? And none of the doctors at the time thought about fibro. None of them brought it up until I saw a rheumatologist. When I saw the rheumatologist, he was just so confident and so self-assured. And I told him, I was like crying in his office. I was like, I need you to be really sure about this diagnosis because I'm going to base my life off of it. And I'm that type of person. When I get a diagnosis, I kind of do my best to research and move my life around that diagnosis. When I diagnosed with PTSD, D, uh, borderline, I feel like I tackled those things and was able to get better because I knew what demon I was fighting. So I told him it's really, really important that we're super sure about this diagnosis. And this last April, end of April, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And I've been living with it. And it's been interesting. And it's had a lot of ups and downs. In the time that I went from feeling really, really bad to working with doctors, working with a nutritionist, working with everyone, till now, I actually even started a relationship, which eventually ended up in an engagement. As you guys know, I'm getting married. And that was really interesting and difficult because we were an ocean away, right? And he flew in from Europe multiple times to be with me. He actually came to be with me for my rheumatology appointments. Super romantic, super cute. And I did appreciate that because honestly, I was crumbling. Some days were better than others, but I was an emotional wreck sometimes. Like I remember New Year's, I uh, I called him. New Year's of this year, I called him and I and I we were supposed to be having a cute New Year's, you know, Discord date. And I just broke down and I said, "Hey, I really need you to help me with my paperwork for the doctor." I said something's really wrong with me and I don't know what's happening. There they said that um women who are in my like category of women, like women who run like businesses and stuff like that. We have like unrelenting standards and we are the biggest bullies to ourselves, which is so fucking true, bro.
Oh, sorry, guys. So, in case anyone was wondering, I don't think fives are impervious to emotions. <laughs> Obviously, um, I feel better, like, sharing it with you guys and, like, trying to be, like, strong and keep it a secret. Like, I am not strong. I am in my feelings, you know? It will be fine. I just feel bad because, you know, a bunch of people want to come see me and they want to make plans. And I legit don't know what my spoons will be like. So, um, I'm sure I'll be fine in like a month or whenever. Now, let me tell you about some of the ways that modern medicine helped and completely ruined me for the last year and a half, right? Since my initial doctors thought I had lupus, they were having me live like I had lupus, right? And this was preemptive. This was well-intentioned. This was because they didn't want me to suffer more. So they had me stop working out. I was working out. I'm not like a gym fanatic or anything. I'm not like a huge gym rat. I'm not I'm not that girl. But yeah, I watched a lot of anime and I had a lot of free time because I was working from home. I'm a YouTuber. And I would just work out as much as I could, whenever I could. I was lifting much heavier weights. I was doing things that were showing definition. I felt pretty good about my workout regimen. And they had me stop working out because they didn't want me to cause more damage if I had autoimmune. Because I stopped working out, I felt like I was declining so severely. I was in insane amounts of pain. If we used a scale, and we'll use a scale for the video, of 1 through 10, 1 to 5 is kind of, I, I don't know, maybe I'll find a pain scale on the internet we can use. But basically, I was feeling like an 8 all the time. I was just... You know, sometimes on New Year's, I felt like a 10. On New Year's, I felt like a 12. I was just a mess. I was like, something is severely wrong. I feel like I'm dying. I remember prior to even getting diagnosed with lupus, prior to not working, like stopping working out, prior to, to when my hair was falling out, when my skin was freaking out, all that stuff, I remember calling my mom and saying, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like my light's going out. I feel like something's wrong with me. So they had me stop working out to get back on track for the story. I stopped working out which ended up being the worst thing for my fibro. The irony is that once they diagnosed me, diagnosed me with fibro, the last few months have been extremely better. I have felt better than I have felt in the last year and a half because I think I've been working out. I've been mobile. I try to do 5,000 steps a day. Or if I don't do all my steps, I try to counteract that with working out at home, like weights, light weights. I mean, literally like one point. Hold on. Here, I have my weight right here. This is 1.25 kilograms and I have two of them and this is it. This is the only amount of weight I can handle right now. I used to do 20 pounds. I used to do a lot more. I used to be able to just, you know, go for it. But now I'm sticking to yoga once a month and this weight right here is my best friend. So again, we love modern science. We love doctors. But because they're were guessing as much as they were confident in their guess, it ended up causing me a lot more unnecessary pain than I needed. But I'm still grateful that I got diagnosed under two years because a lot of people take two to five years to get diagnosed. So I feel pretty lucky that I got diagnosed under two years. But of course, the irony is that I should have been working out that whole time just in smaller spurts. So the rheumatologist gave me the advice. He gave me very important advice that I want to share with you guys who are in a struggling sort of situation with fibro if you have it. He gave me this advice. He said, Brittany, there's two kinds of people that got fibro. The people who give up because it's so painful, it's so awful, the fatigue, the brain fog, all of it is just so much that they stop living their life or you can work out, live your life like normal and actually be a person and your life will be better, but it will be hard. And I said, okay, well, obviously we're going to go for that one because I'm me and also I'm engaged and I'm living my life and I'm not about to give up on it. I already survived borderline. I already survived PTSD. I already survived mental health. I most certainly am going to survive fibro. And so that has been my decision. My decision has been to survive fibro. It's not perfect. I'm not always the best at it. I am kind of a complainer. And every day by the second cup of coffee, I feel awful. But since I have a supportive partner and I have a good supportive family, it's gotten better. So that's the basics of my fibro journey, right? I'm going to go into more detail now, but some of these conversations might be a little 
harder to hear depending on where you are in your chronic health journey. So remember, like, your journey is your journey and this is my journey, but it was not easy. Some of these things that I had to go through, I'll give you an example of one that comes to mind right away. I have a supportive system now. Family, friends, everyone's on the fibro train. But during the diagnosis process, I got in fights with people in my life because they couldn't handle the fact that I was sick. They didn't like the idea that they couldn't help me. They felt powerless. I remember having fights with my mom. I remember calling my mom and saying, oh my gosh, is this MS? Like, is this cancer? Like, what is this? Because I feel like I'm dying. I just feel like I'm dying and I don't know what's wrong. And she was like, stop it. You're not sick. It's in your head. You're making it up. My dad at the time, he's like, it's what you're eating. You're, you know, this isn't like, this isn't, you know, this isn't a sickness. This is like in your head type thing. And I remember feeling like this is not the kind of support that I needed. I needed something more. I had friends. I had people I had to tell, like, I can't help you deal with the fact that I'm sick. Like, that has to be your journey. I'm sick and I need to deal with that on my own. And it was awful. I spent so many nights crying, so many nights, like, hating my body, so many nights wondering, like, oh, my gosh, is this it? Did I just, like, beat borderline and beat PTSD just to fail to this, like, mythical disease that I wasn't even sure was lupus or fiber or whatever? Because remember, this is going on pre-diagnosis of fibro. Fibro just got diagnosed. So I'm dealing with this what is it stage as well. During this process, I came to realize that chronic pain, and I knew I had so many callers who had chronic pain. I had so many patrons who have chronic pain. I had so many people in my life with chronic pain. But it is exactly how they described it to me before experiencing it. It is the invisible demon that no one sees but you feel 100%. I've already had people in my life doubt that it's real. They've already said to me like, oh, this feels like it's made up, which is why we reference the government website, right? We're using the reference <laughs> of the government website to talk about something that is a real phenomenon that people can't see. And then they see me on the beach and they see me working out and they see me doing all my videos and they see me vlogging and they're like, oh, she's not sick. But if I don't do those things, if I don't exercise, I get worse. And then someone will say, oh, well, that's just everybody. Everybody has to work out so they don't get sick. I wish. This invisible little demon that is my best friend now is just, it's just so personal that it almost becomes frustrating to have to explain myself. So I, I mostly choose not to. I just kind of be like, yeah, it's fibro, it's whatever. And it is whatever, right? Like there are illnesses that are definitely worse. And at the same time, I wouldn't wish this on people. It is a frustrating illness to have just because it's constantly there. So let's say your pain scale is one to 10. I feel like I'm always like a five, like a five, six. I feel like I'm something like four, five, six. I feel like I'm always in the, I shouldn't be feeling any pain like a normal person. I'm always like a four, five, six. And it shifts and varies. I haven't, as long as I'm working out, I haven't gone back to an 8, 9, 10, a 7. I haven't felt that horrible pain I felt on New Year's. Now it's just dealing with the psychological relationship I'm having with my body. So one of the hardest things about fibro is the change in my desire to be a mother. And again, this might be a little emotional for some people, and I'll try not to cry. But I know for me, I'm very uncomfortable in my body now, and I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of pushing something out of my body. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of taking care of a consciousness that I can't care for long term. I'm very concerned because every day is a maintenance day for my mental health, and every day is a maintenance day for my fibro that I couldn't imagine being the worker that I am, the sick person that I am, and then bringing a consciousness into the universe that is going to impact my body's health and then have to recover. And then I'm going to have to take care of that consciousness till the day that I die because you don't ever stop being a parent even after they turn 18. And so there's a lot that happened to me in the last year that completely shifted who I am. You guys know my content and you know that I have wanted to be a mother since I was a child. You know that my core word is mother. You know that being a mom was a huge goal of mine a couple years ago, even being a single mother, you know, before I found my partner. Like I wasn't, I was so on track. So, so this is kind of like just fear speaking, you know, it's just that I'm fearful. I won't be a parent. Like, it's so funny. 
I just so funny hearing all these people be like, I'm so glad I'm not a mom. Like, who wants to be a mom? And I'm like, fuck me, bitch, me. Like, uh, for every person that doesn't want to be a parent, which I love for you, obviously, like, I'm so supportive of no kids people. Like, obviously, you shouldn't have kids if you don't want to. But a part of me wishes that, like, <laughs> I could, like, take your, like, positive energy and, like, make it, you know what I mean? I've just, like, always wanted to be a mom. So... It's just kind of shitty. So we'll see what happens. I'm sure I'll be fine. Like, again, I'm so, I'm so realistically positive. It's just I have to mourn. I have to go through the motions of accepting that I might not get my ideal dream. That I have to settle for my other ideal dream. So I've, <clears throat> I've. I'm, uh, hold on, God. Come on, throat. I, um, I always have a plan B. <laughs> and my plan B is pretty fucking cool. My plan B is pretty fucking cool. So I know I'm going to be happy anyways. Like, I know it'll be fine. I just, I'm going to have to have space to mourn uh, whatever I don't end up getting. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not a, I'm a very strong person. But I don't have a lot of spoons. And I didn't have enough spoons to, to already begin with. So let's say I started off with 20 spoons. I have like 10. And I'm hoping to get back up to 20. Because if I can get up to 20, then I can manage a kid. Because I know I can manage a kid on 20 spoons. But if I'm even down to 15 permanently, I don't think Brittany can do that. Like, I know other people can do it. I don't know that Brittany can do it. Not as a single mother. You know what I mean? Which is, like, kind of what will probably... You know what I'm saying? So, again, um, I'm just trying to be realistic. Like, I don't... I want the encouragement, but I don't also... I hate false hope. I hate tricking my brain into thinking, oh, you can still do that. I, need, I want to accept the realistic statistical probability for my life. I had this moment where I was crying in the bathtub as one does and I was in the dark and I was just like, oh my God, I'm not going to be a mom. And I mourned, had like a mini funeral for myself, for my motherhood. I let it go. And at the same time, it was and is always going to be a part of my my story, like, am I not going to be a mom? But the truth is, is that I, I don't know exactly, but I have a feeling that I might not be a mom, like in a real way, like in a, I always feel like a mom, right? A mom assignment. I always feel like a mom, but I, I don't know that I, this Brittany is going to be capable of caring for like a unique consciousness in the universe, right? So I had this like really personal morning. And then I called my friend who's a priest and my friend who's a priest is lovely. He's a year older than me. We're friends. And I called him and I said, hey, I'm having a struggle with the idea of not being a mother. And I'm good. I got to talk to somebody about this. Let's talk to a priest, you know, because he is a father. And he had told me that, you know, if he wasn't a priest, he would have loved to have been a dad. But he became the father of a church. And I became the mother of, well, the internet, right? In some ways, right? Mama Simon and he's father. And we have these roles that don't involve biological children or adopted children in the same way. We don't have the responsibility of raising a consciousness. We don't have that. What we have are opportunities to be a part of a community and to be sort of a voice in the community that says you can go from sick to healthy, being a voice in the community that says a diagnosis is not a death sentence. Well, unless it is. But to be fair, all of life is a death sentence. I get to be a voice in the community that says I might not have children in the sense that I might not raise them. But I'm happy to be a sort of mother figure or an auntie figure or a sister figure or a figure that says, like, I will care for people who need a moment of care. Because mothers, though they mother for the rest of their life, also are obligated, I think, when they're good mothers, to raise children that leave. 
to encourage people not to be too attached at the hip to their mothers, even though you never stop mothering. I think the hardest part is hearing from people who are well-intentioned sometimes. And again, this isn't me trying to discourage you from being nice, but I do think it's less kind in the long run when people come to me and say like, you can have a kid on fibro, no problem. You can have a kid on X disease, no problem. You can have a kid on X illness, no problem. I think people are quick to make new babies. I think people are quick to think everything will be fine. I think people are quick to have lower standards than I would have for having a, a baby, no offense. I don't want to have a baby if that's going to lower my quality of life because I will be a bad mother. Because lowering my quality of life means risking my mental health relapse. It means having possible borderline episodes and distortions. It means possibly accidentally mentally abusing my child because I've now been triggered. It means possibly running into situations where my partner becomes so overwhelmed by all of the responsibility they might end up with because they have a sick spouse and now a child to raise. It means putting pressure on my relationship. It means putting pressure on my finances, which as a gig worker, as a YouTuber, this isn't guaranteed. I have no idea how long this will last. I have no idea if I'll have money tomorrow. I have no idea. And it doesn't matter if you're a multi-million dollar YouTuber. If you don't have money saved, invested, if you're not thinking about retirement, which by the way, is 1099 workers we don't have, you're not really ready to guarantee sort of a stable future for a young consciousness. It's one thing for me to struggle. It's another thing to force a person to exist in, into existence and an existence that is struggling. Now, look, all over the world, people do this all the time. So again, you do you. But my standard says be more thoughtful and kind before producing another person. So I don't reach my standard of what I think a good mother would be in my state of being right now. I'm way too new to dealing with my fibro. As you guys know, if you're watching the vlogs, I talk about it a lot. I'm way too new into my relationship. I'm way too new into trying to move to a foreign country, right? I'm trying to move to Europe. I'm trying to go through immigration. I'm trying to start this life. Now is not the time to have a baby, which is why we got our lucky, lucky birth control. The irony of the birth control. I'm on Nixaplan on. And it's great, but it's awful, but it's great. Sometimes I'm bleeding for $20, 20, $20, 20 days out of the month. Sometimes I'm just cramping all the time. Sometimes it's impacting my fibro, but at least I'm not having a baby. I have to pick and choose every day, right? How to have a relationship with this new body. But I think not being a mother was the hardest part of the fibro. I never had an image of me not being a mother. I was the kind of woman that would say things like, I'd rather have a baby than a relationship because I wanted to be a mother. And now that I'm in this relationship, I'm lucky that my partner is not only flexible and open and caring, but that we're in this as a team. And it's really about making our lives the best because he also has that standard of parenting that I have. And he agrees that unless we're 100% sure about my fibro and my relationship with everything and my job and his situ everything, we wouldn't bring a kid into the world. So I'm really lucky that I ended up with somebody who came just as I was getting diagnosed. Like before I got diagnosed, he was he was dating me. He came into my life. I remember we had our first eight hour date and I told him, hey, like I'm going through it. Okay, here's all my medical history. And now I'm about to, I, you know, I think I have lupus. They think I have lupus and I'm about to get officially diagnosed soon. I'm doing all these tests. I don't know how long, much longer it will take. You know, here I am basically becoming a new person and this person walks into my life and says, okay. And now, you know, that person is in my life and here we are trying to make a life in Europe because that's where he's from. And, and every day is a conversation about where I'm at. Where is he at? Where's my body at? Where's my health at? Where's our future at? And I'm giving myself a time limit of when to have a child. So I'm giving myself until 36 to have a biological child. And well into our 50s and 60s in terms of adoption because, well, we don't exactly need our – I don't – you know what I mean? I don't need to worry about the pressures of having the baby. Having a baby is a big deal. It can change so many things in your body. What if it shifts my hormones? What if I end up getting triggered? What if my borderline becomes an issue? What if I have postpartum? What if I can't deal with it? What if I don't have the support system? 
what if my job, I lose my job because my job is a job where I have to work every day. I can't take a month off. I don't have that kind of job. I don't have that kind of income. I don't have that kind of luxury, right? Having a baby physically is putting such a pressure on your body that I don't know that it's worth the risk. But I, again, I never thought about it until I got fibro. Prior to fibro, my body was awesome. I felt great. I was running around with my nieces and nephews, working on the farm, doing things. I was just like, I can do things. And now I'm like, can I do that? Can I even do that? Can I do that? I have to ask myself, like, can I do that? (sighs) Somebody wrote me on Instagram and asked me how I move through the pain. How do I get it done anyways? And the truth is, with a lot of grace, with a lot of leeway, with a lot of forgiveness, with a lot of gray area, with a lot of, eh, doesn't have to be perfect. I'm still in the beginning stages of creating a routine, getting used to working out, figuring out my limitations. So there's going to be and has to be room for taking it easy. So like this week, okay? We did arms and it crushed me for like two days. I was dying. Okay. I did push ups, dying. I was following lean beef patty, love patty, dying, just doing a little bit of a push up workout. Okay. Then I took a rest and then I switched it to abs. That went great. Did legs. Okay. A little shaky today, but I did my steps. Okay. We did like 4,400 steps, I think, today, which is pretty good. Right. So I've got like, I'm having like this healthy, oh, okay. But Because I'm me and this is me, I have a standard. So I give myself a gold star if I reached my goals, but I give myself a, you did good enough, girl, if I don't. But I have this goal, this goal that might even be a little unattainable, but I need to have it to even reach in the first place. When the rheumatologist told me that people with fibro either give up or work really hard not to, I think I'm getting what he means. Because genuinely, when I don't have that goal, that I know and I think is attainable, but it might not be, I don't know yet, but I think it is, right? When I see that goal, it makes me wanna work towards it. If I tell myself every day, like I don't have to reach this goal, then honestly, I do just wanna sit in bed and scroll tuck talk. I don't even wanna film, I don't wanna do anything, I just wanna die. But not really, it's just like my body is constantly aching and it just wants to sit down and the brain fog is insane and then My spoons are out so quickly. And so there is something to be said about, okay, I need to shoot for the stars, but also work within a reasonable time frame, right? Not rush myself, but not give in to my laziness either. Because I don't know about you, but it sounds nice to just lay in bed. Today, this is my second video I filmed today. And I'm like, good, props, Brittany. It's 10, 18 p.m. There's a storm outside. My partner is like, kind of doing his own thing. My cat's chilling. But eventually, I'm going to have to end the workday today. Eventually, I'm going to have to turn off this computer. And I'm going to have to get myself ready for sleep, which takes two to three hours for me to finally wind down enough to shut down my brain. And then I have to wake up and do it all over again. Right? There's just a lot more that goes into my everyday. So when this person asks me, and I love this question, like, how do I push through? It's not how. It's why. Because if I don't, I'll die. If I don't, I will become a shell of a person. If I don't work hard at maintaining my borderline and taking care of my triggers and maintaining my health, if I don't work very hard to the best of my ability every day, which is not perfect, it's just best of my ability, true best, if I don't do that, I am afraid I will decline into a shell of myself. Look, I think I'm an introspective person. I think I've spent my whole life being introspective and I will continue to do so. I'm still earning my right to wisdom, which starts with and ends with humility. And fibromyalgia is a pathway into that humility, path into that wisdom, which is why I think it will be a lifelong struggle to be a wise person, right? I don't have wisdom when it comes to my fibro. I don't have wisdom in the way that I would like, in the way that I assume I will earn as I age. And this is a part of it. Do I have the wisdom right now to get my exercises done? You know, it was really comforting the other day. I I, um, met this person, this really lovely human, 
And they were relating to how someone in their life has fibro and they watched them give up. I think about the people in my life that have fibro and how they gave up. It's scary. It's now that I think about their lives, I'm like, oh, my gosh, it makes so much sense now because I wondered, you know, I was watching these women give up on their life. They gave up on their bodies. Okay, they gave up on their children and their families. They gave up on being functional. They gave up on trying. And I was thinking to myself, like, why would they do that? But my whole life, I didn't know. I had no concrete concept of fibro. And then when I got diagnosed, I was like, oh, my gosh, it makes sense. And look, my heart goes out to people who don't have the tools. But the tool is why. The tool isn't how. The tool is why. Unless you want to say the how is the why. Why should you get up and work? Why should you get up and try? Why? Because giving up is worse. For me, giving up is worse than trying. I'm picking the easy path. Trying is easier for me. But it is difficult because you can't just try a little. You actually have to try, try. And that's where it gets harder. And that's where I feel like giving up sometimes. So choosing, saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to totally do it. I got this. Move over, fibro. I got it. That's easy. Actually doing it every day and doing it and trying to stay diligent and trying to be careful about what I'm eating and like not dyeing my hair because of inflammation and not consuming sugar because of inflammation and still enjoying my life and still having some cake on occasion. Like that's difficult, but it's doable and I'm grateful that it's doable. And I think the why really f- helps me with my foundation. Like it really, f- um, not foundation, it helps um, ground me. That's the word. It helps ground me when I'm feeling like giving up. And again, giving up to me is like, I don't want to do it. I just want to lay in bed. Today, we went to town. We did some stuff. We, you know, uh, we, ooh, we picked up some new merch. So exciting. It's about to launch. Thank you. We went out. It's thunderstorming. It's raining. We're tired. We both feel a little, you know, tired just from the stress of the immigration process and everything we're doing right now. And we just want to cuddle in bed and not move. But man, if we do that, our life is going to pass us by. If we just give in to those very weak desires, our life is going to pass us by and the whole world's not going to wait for us. The immigration office doesn't care that we're tired. Tax guy doesn't care if I'm tired. My job doesn't care if I'm tired. My life doesn't care if I'm tired. There is life to be lived and you can't live it if you're tired and you're giving up. So I've chosen to live, okay? And for as long as I choose to live, I have to make an effort. This all goes down to my belief system, my personal belief system that we're evolved animals on a planet. I'm not convinced there's a God. I'm not convinced we know exactly what we're doing here. And so I have to do my best to live the individualistic life I would like to live. The world functions the way it functions. And then regardless of me being sick, I still have to function within those systems, within those bubbles, right? So me being sick is just like another card that I got dealt to make it a little harder but it doesn't stop me from actually getting the life I want. It won't stop me from being successful at my job. It won't stop me from getting the house I want or having the life I want. It won't really stop me from even having kids. It will just make me question whether or not I need to recontextualize, reimagine my life because kids are not a requirement of my joy, right? They're not. As much as I would love kids to be a must-have, a part of my joy, something happened during my diagnosis where they stopped being that. Because I do think having having kids is a privilege. I do think having kids is selfish in a good way. And I do think having kids is unnecessary. So it's not necessary. If my identity wasn't going to be fulfilled, if I wasn't going to feel like a human unless I had kids, I think that that would be difficult. And I think prior Brittany, prior to getting sick, that Brittany probably felt that way. But this Brittany, like I, I don't know. I look at these little babinos and I love them. They're so cute and precious. But like, I'm just a different person now. And this person, she might not be a mom. 
And I think I'm pretty okay with that. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm sad about it, but there's it's so much less now. It, forgive my French, but it kind of feels like I really want a dog, but I just don't live in a house and I'm not putting a dog in an apartment. I really want a kid, but I'm not putting a kid in an apartment and I'm not raising a kid in, in this situation, right? It just feels like it doesn't make sense. I think if it made more sense, I would work towards it more. So here is the second question I had to ask myself in relation to this diagnosis. I'm still going to get my house. I'm still going to get better at my job. I'm still going to work really hard at those things. Why, if I wanted a kid my whole life and I'm willing to still work for that kid? Oh, I'm sorry. Scratch that. And I'm still, okay, hold on. If I wanted a kid my whole life and I wanted a house my whole life and I got sick, why am I keeping the house and not the kid? And it's because the house is about me. The kid is about me. But whether or not I get that house doesn't impact anyone but me. Whether or not I have a kid impacts me and that kid. And my partner, of course, but he can handle it. But it impacts that kid, that real consciousness. I take so seriously having kids that it became unnecessary to have them because the importance of where I am mentally and physically and spiritually and all that stuff impacts another consciousness so hard that I can't be casual about it. Does that make sense? Something changed, something shifted so significantly in me where I just don't have it anymore. I don't have that I must have a baby feeling anymore. Instead, I have a, that sounds nice. I'm not sure about that. That sounds nice. I'm not sure about that. Even if I had like $5 million, even if I had all the money in the world, I'm not convinced that would fix my problem. I think something significantly shifted inside of me and kids became an option. And the moment they became an option, I stopped striving for it. I stopped working towards it. I think if they were still a must have, then I would be working really hard to get my fiber 100% under control. I'd be working really hard to make my job consistent. I'd be working really hard to build a life for a child. But I just don't think that they're a requirement anymore. And so I just don't feel that motivation. So that's like kind of the difference, right? I can't justify having a child, but I'm gonna justify getting the house girl, whether it's an apartment house or a house house, but like something's gonna be mine. And I'm gonna do that while I'm sick, while I'm fatigued, while I'm brain fogged, while I'm losing my hair, while I have chronic pain, because I can. I cannot work this job and have a child and try to get a house and do all these things when having a child is an option. I just can't pick that option. It doesn't make sense to me anymore. But I'm kind of grateful for that. I think without the shift in my narrative, this would have been so much more devastating. But it was, that's what I'm trying to say. Remember that crying in the bathtub moment? That was my devastation. I mourned so hard not being a mother. I think I mourned it to death. I think I mourned it to death. And now I'm this new version of me that can't even really relate to that Brittany, but I remember her fondly. And that's kind of crazy to me. I just, I can't, even the girls in my life, the women in my life are like, um, who is this Brittany? You've always wanted kids. And I'm like, that Brittany didn't have fibro. The Brittany that got fibro, the Brittany that mourned her motherhood in out of existence, that Brittany, this one here, kids are optional right? So one of the things Fibro did for me is it put into perspective what is optional and what isn't optional with this current consciousness that is me, right? So right now, things that are not optional, failing at my job, failing at my health. So again, going back to that Instagram question of like, how do you push through the pain? That I don't have an option not to. I'm not allowed to give up. Because if I give up, like, Borderline didn't make me give up. PTSD didn't make me give up. Suicidal ideations didn't make me give up. Attempts didn't make me give up. Having no money in my bank account didn't make me give up. Getting fired from my job prior, you know, in my 20s didn't make me give up. Fibro is not going to be that thing. It's just not. But I can understand why it is for some people. It's pretty awful. 
But for me, I refuse to let it be the end of my world, especially since I just found my person. I just found the literal consciousness in the whole world that I get to spend life with who makes me feel so seen and just like it's the most wonderful, magical relationship. Oh, I just want to stop this podcast so I can go hang out with him. I found that person. I'm not about to give up on life, right? But even prior to finding him, it was clear that giving up was never the option, right? But getting back on track might take time. So right now I'm in the process of forgiving myself for needing to take time because I am a little frustrated that I'm not working as much. I am a little frustrated that I'm falling behind. I am a little frustrated that I can't just do live shows, that I can't just do social events, that I can't do all the things I want to do. I am a little frustrated with my body and how I run out of spoons so quickly and the days seem so short. The days aren't even that short, but they feel like they're over in six hours and I'm like, what the heck? So I'm on the path of like forgiving myself and working with myself, but never stopping from attaining that goal, even when it's hard. Because there is no option to give up. It's just not even an option. Which begs the question, how many of you guys in my audience, because I know a lot of you have chronic health, are any of you in a position where it's an option to give up? What is that like? Like, I'm so curious. What is that like to be in a position where... You've decided to give up. Okay, so I just asked my partner if he had any thoughts to share about what it's like from his perspective dating somebody with fibro. And he said, um, let's see if I can summarize it because it was quite lovely. But basically that he can only imagine, of course, what it's like to be somebody with the fibro. So he feels like he's only feeling a percentage of that pain watching someone he loves in pain, which I think is reasonable. And I think many partners feel that way. So if you're a partner of somebody with chronic illness, I think it is very fair for you to also feel like, oh, this like feeling of helplessness or pain because you're watching somebody you love go through something very difficult. I think that's really normal and really, really fair, right? He said that I am such a boy and suffer from the toxic masculinity that I have a tendency to kind of push through the pain in a very like, I can do it, but also I'm going to complain about it so you know that I'm doing it, which is true. I do complain all the time. I am constantly letting people know I am in pain, but also I think it's so necessary for me to acknowledge it because it does help me kind of push through it, but I, I... Yeah, I do get to vocalize it a lot. He allows me to really express myself. He allows me not to like shy away. He never punishes me or lashes out at me if he feels like I'm expressing my pain too much. But I also obviously I'm I'm doing it in a very real way, but also I want him to know where I'm at so we can kind of be successful as the team that we feel like we are. I don't know if a lot of couples do this, but I get but I guess between him and I we tell each other like everything that's going on like How does our body feel? How are our moods? Are we hungry? Like, we're very just like, tell me everything. So I am always like, (laughs) I'm in pain. And it always like the first point of the day that it hits me the most, sometimes we'll be just waking up, but it's like our second cup of coffee. We're middle of our second episode of One Piece because that's how we start off our mornings. We wake up, watch two episodes of One Piece and have two cups of coffee. And by my second cup, by the second episode of One Piece, I am just in so much pain. Um, and he just, you know, he sits there and he comforts me through it, but that comfort, that ability to express myself, my ability to say openly and vulnerably, like I hurt, but also don't stop the episode. I hurt, but also let's go for a walk. I hurt, but also let's still go to the grocery store. I hurt, but make sure that we're still living our life. That's really amazing. You know what I mean? Because it allows me to state a fact express myself and it still allows me to keep continuing my life now him and I well I'll speak for myself because I don't you know but I am an optimist and I am a very specific kind of optimist I try to be realistic I'm in pain but also we're still gonna live our life I am not a pessimist I am not a person who by any account would like try to bring someone down with my mood so I think it's probably easier for him to hear that I'm in pain because I'm never going to blame him for the pain. He's never the fault of the pain. I'm I'm usually, you know, pretty good at, at expressing if I'm in a pretty foul mood, usually related to the pain. I, I want to make sure that it's never targeted towards him. The last thing I want to do if I'm chronically ill is like push my frustration at him. 
but I do get frustrated at my body. Like right now in particular, I've been waving my hands around a lot, a lot. And I will say there is quite an amount of pain in my wrists and arms, which is where my pain mostly sits. So there's a part of my brain that isn't doing this podcast. And I'm thinking in my head, like, oh my gosh, my hands are aching. And I'm just thinking like, what should I do about my hands after the podcast? Well, I'm still trying to talk to you during the podcast. So like my brain is always like half in my pain. It's always like half aware. It's always in there. But I'm really trying to make sure that I'm not pessimistic. I'm really trying to make sure I'm not pushing it on other people. I'm really trying to make sure that, again, I'm having a relationship with my body, kind of like it's its own entity. Like here's Brittany, the consciousness, and it lives in this body. And this body is like a, a ship sailing through the ocean. And it's having its own relationship with the turbulence of the ocean, its own wear and tear, its own relationship with um, falling apart and getting repaired by me, the consciousness, right? So I will say there's like a weird relationship that's happening between me and then what I'm conveying to my partner and how he's handling it. One of the things that comes to mind about this sort of like toxic masculinity, also in denial that I'm in pain and I'm going to push through narrative is when I was r being raised by my mother who is wonderful and amazing in many ways and dealt with her own pain growing up. She had 10 kids and she was like a super mom. She had dinner ready and cleaned the house and gave us all appropriate chores and made sure the house ran and made sure the money was good and made sure all of these things while my dad was like doing his engineering stuff and like everything worked really well. Like my mom ran a tight ship, okay? But one of the things that I learned as I aged, as I became an adult, is like my mother doesn't like to cook, which is insane by the way because my mother is like an amazing cook. But my mom has religion and she said she would offer up her pain Whatever it was, whether it was her body or her stress or her lack of desire to cook, she would offer it up to God, right? She would. She had this like outlet to give it to someone. And I think every day as a secularist, as an atheist, like who am I giving my pain to? And the truth is, is I'm not really giving it up to somebody. I'm not saying like, oh, this is for the sins of the world or this is to God. Instead, I think I am learning to have a relationship with it where I don't become bitter and I don't become resentful, and I don't become a pessimist. I am terrified of becoming a, a, a truly mean person. Like, I am terrified of turning into a horrible person. I don't think I will be. I don't think I will give over to that pain. But there are some people in the world that are so consumed by their own pain. They are the that side of weakness I always talk about where they give into their pain so badly that they just drag people down with them, which is why I'm always trying to have a strong relationship with myself. And I'll have a podcast on that coming up about how to go from a weak person to a strong person or how to have a relationship with weakness and, and strength because I am weak right now, physically, emotionally. I'm very vulnerable. I'm very like meh, about my feelings around my fibro and everything and about shifting narratives about being a mother. Like I'm very weak in that sense, meaning my foundation is like good, but my like my walls are thin. But I'm not weak in character, weak in spirit. I'm hopefully, as far as I know, not making other people's lives miserable just because I'm in pain. And that is something that I do take from my mother. My mother didn't always perfectly mother and as she got tools later in life was willing to admit like oh yeah I do have like some things here I could work on but she never purposely purposely with intent tried to make people suffer she just did that because she was herself and I did that because I was myself and we do that because we're ourselves we by being ourselves can accidentally cause suffering which is why it's always nice to hear an apology it's always nice to be better but I do think it's important to know what's your relationship like with your pain and are you heading in a direction of bitterness? Again, the last person I want to take out my pain on is my partner. The last person I want to accidentally abuse is myself or my partner. The last, you know what I mean? I'm really prioritizing his health as well as my health because I have to prioritize this relationship. It's what I'm doing for the next 50 years. Fibro is also what I'll be doing for the next 50 years, but hopefully it won't be a main character in the way that it is right now. My borderline is less and less of a main character as I age. My PTSD is less and less of a main character as I age. I'm hoping my fibro becomes less of a main character as I age. I'm not saying that the fibro will go away, right? There's no cure. I read that to you earlier, 
but I'm hoping it won't be the thing I always talk about in my videos or the thing that is like on my mind all the time. I hope I have such a good and healthy relationship with my fibro that it just becomes another thing to maintain, like my borderline. My borderline is just a thing I maintain. Most of my family and friends, like my sister or my besties and stuff like that, they're not seeing episodic Britney. They're not seeing distortion Britney. They're not seeing Britney who's like losing herself to her borderline. They haven't seen her in like three, four years. So hopefully it will be similar with the fibro that over time, my fibro will be less of a main character. That's my hope and my goal, but that's a long-term goal. So again, we're going to be patient and kind and we're going to aim for happy and joyful and we're going to aim for consistent. Okay, I think that's all I want to say on the fibro. I'm sure you guys have other comments and questions and I'll just make more content about it if you do. But I hope I answered that question on Instagram. How do I push through the pain? How do I get things done? Because I have to. Because giving up is not an option. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Have the most fantastic day and I'll see you next podcast. Bye. And my head in real life while in bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool